Welcome back, dear students. The aim of today's lecture is to determine the performance limits of an aircraft as a function of altitude. In other words, what are the combinations of airspeed and altitude at which an aircraft can fly? You can imagine this is quite an important figure for the user of an aircraft. It shows, for example, what the maximum achievable altitude is and at which altitude you can fly the fastest. So, by the end of this lecture, you will be able to calculate how high, for example, this aircraft can fly and why it has this specific shape. Now, in the previous item, we derived how the performance diagram changes as a function of altitude. When flying at a constant angle of attack and increasing altitude, the airspeed must increase to maintain sufficient lift. As a consequence, the aerodynamic drag remains the same due to the fact that airspeed increases and air density decreases. In essence, the dynamic pressure stays constant. As a result, the drag curve shifts to the right for increasing altitude. At the same time, the engine delivers less thrust, mainly due to a smaller mass flow through the engine. So what does this mean for our performance limits? the minimum and the maximum airspeed. Furthermore, what does it do to the achievable maximum rate of climb? Now you can imagine that at the maximum altitude, the maximum rate of climb equals zero. Now let us start with the minimum airspeed. We already know that in steady horizontal flight, lift equals weight, and from this we can derive the airspeed equation. In order to fly as slow as possible, the angle of attack should be maximum. At higher altitude, air density reduces and therefore the minimum airspeed increases, simply because of the thinner air. Now the aircraft has to fly faster in thinner air to create the same amount of lift. But is this the complete story? No, it is not. Let us have a look at the performance diagram again. The minimum airspeed due to the aerodynamic limit, CL max, is the point where the drag curve stops. However, when altitude increases, this curve shifts to the right, as we determined last time, and the maximum available thrust level decreases as well. At a specific altitude, these graphs will actually intersect. Now when this happens, the point for CO max occurs at a drag value which is larger than the maximum thrust level. In other words, there is not sufficient engine power to fly at the minimum aerodynamic airspeed. So, the minimum airspeed in steady horizontal flight can in fact be limited by the available power. Now that is an interesting phenomenon, is it? So let's draw the minimum airspeed as a function of altitude. The minimum airspeed you would expect based on the airspeed equation, CL max and the air density, looks more or less like this. At some altitude, the power limit will become dominant as indicated here. Great! If we now do the same exercise for the maximum airspeed, we see how the aircraft behaves on the other side of the spectrum. Again, we can use the performance diagram to investigate this. As you probably remember, the maximum airspeed is determined by the intersection of the drag curve and the maximum thrust curve. Imagine this is the situation for sea level conditions. What happens if we increase altitude? The drag curve will start to shift to the right, which suggests that the maximum airspeed increases. On the other hand, maximum thrust reduces as well, which results in a decreasing maximum airspeed. Now, depending on the specific engine characteristics, in other words, by how much thrust reduces at a specific altitude, maximum speed will either increase or decrease. Now, that does not really solve our problem completely. I am therefore going to consider three characteristic altitude changes of the maximum power available. The first is an engine with maximum power available directly proportional to air density. The second is a supercharged piston engine with a propeller which has constant maximum power available up to a specific altitude and beyond that altitude it behaves just like the first case which represented more a generic piston engine. Now the third case I will consider is typical for a turboprop aircraft. 
A turboprop typically shows behavior in which maximum power available divided by maximum power available at sea level equals the ratio of air density and air density at sea level to the power n, with n being smaller than 1. Now if we have such a relation for the specific engine, we can calculate the maximum power available at any specific altitude as indicated in the diagram you see here. Now combined with the power required curve in the performance diagram for various altitudes, we can calculate the maximum airspeed as a function of altitude. Now, I have already done the calculation for you, but there is also a nice homework assignment where you are asked to calculate the maximum airspeed as a function of altitude for one specific aircraft yourself. Now let me show you what the maximum airspeed limit looks like for the three scenarios we just considered. In the first case, the maximum power available drops quite rapidly and is therefore the dominant effect in determining the maximum airspeed. Hence, maximum airspeed decreases as a function of altitude. In the second case, a supercharged piston engine, engine power stays constant at low altitude. Hence, the airspeed limit change is dominated by aerodynamic effects and thus maximum airspeed increases first. Now, from a certain altitude, it decreases just like in the first scenario. In the final case, a turboprop, the aerodynamic and power effects balance each other more or less out up to a certain altitude where maximum airspeed reduces quite rapidly. So, I've just derived what happens to the minimum and maximum airspeed. Now let us see what happens to the maximum rate of climb. As you already know, maximum rate of climb is determined by the difference between the power required to overcome aerodynamic drag and the power available from the engine. In other words, the energy we have in, in excess each second can be used to increase the potential air energy of the aircraft each second. In the performance diagram, the achievable rate of climb for a specific airspeed can be observed directly by the distance between the two curves. If the altitude increases, the two curves come closer to each other, meaning that there is less energy in excess to climb. So the maximum rate of climb decreases and at some point it becomes zero. Now this is the condition where the power required and the power available curve just touch each other. You could also observe that the airspeed at which maximum rate of climb is achieved actually increases steadily with increasing altitude. So if I would make a graph with the maximum rate of climb as a function of altitude, it will steadily decrease. Now the condition where maximum rate of climb equals zero is the absolute or theoretical ceiling of the aircraft where it can fly steadily. Any deviation from the airspeed required for that specific condition, due to for example some turbulence, will result in a decrease or increase of the airspeed, meaning that maximum power available is not sufficient anymore and making the airplane descend again. So in practice it is not possible to fly at the absolute ceiling you see right here for a prolonged period of time. On the other hand, it is perfectly well possible to fly sli slightly lower at what we call the service ceiling. In that condition, there is a small amount of excess power available. So, now we have determined all three performance limits. The maximum airspeed, the minimum airspeed and the maximum altitude. Let's combine these in one big figure. This diagram shows us all combinations of airspeeds and, and altitude at which an aircraft can fly. A large part of this diagram is limited by the available thrust but part of it is also limited by the aerodynamics. Perhaps interesting to note that at the theoretical ceiling, the condition for minimum airspeed, maximum airspeed and maximum rate of climb have all converged into one single point. Now this diagram shows us what the aircraft is able to do. However, that does not mean that the aircraft is also allowed to fly at all those conditions. There are some other operational limits which we also need to take into account. And that is the next topic of the next item in this lecture series.